High Vibe Nation is live. Welcome to the High Vibe Nation, where we have set out to raise the vibration of every human being on the planet. Your hosts on this journey are Sherry Gideons and Pamela Aubrey. So let's join them now in their current interview with a high vibing individual. Hello and welcome to the High Vibe Nation, the number one positive media show focused on raising the vibe of the planet, a space for you to remember the power within you. It's a love revolution. I'm your host, Sherry Gideons, and this is my co-host, Pamela Aubrey. Welcome, everyone. So great to be here with you and to have our guest, Lindsay Wander. She originally enrolled at Cal State Fresno to study biomedical engineering. And four years later, she discovered her passion for teaching and re-enrolled in college to earn her teaching credentials. For several years, Lindsay taught math, biology, and STEM in the low-income neighborhoods of California. But due to endless bureaucratic red tape, many of her kits fell through the cracks. So when Lindsay moved to Chicago at the ripe age of 30, she decided to start her own tutoring business, which later became Worldwide Tutoring. Lindsay found a career that she loves, and that makes the world a better place. She and her goal is to inspire her students to do the same in the world. So welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thanks welcome. for having me. <laughs> Great to have you here. So as you may know, on this show, we like to talk about being high vibe. So tell us what it means to you to be high vibe. Um, I would say high vibe is probably just being your authentic self and staying positive about, you know, whatever the world has to offer. So finding the good in even times like now when it's a little hard to find the good, really working hard to find the good even in those dark times. I love that. Awesome. I love that. Beautiful. And, you know, that's the beautiful thing about being high vibe. It's so sweet and individualized to each of us and spreading that message. And so that being said, I love the name of Worldwise Tutoring. I mean, it speaks so specifically to opening us up, up to that wisdom that's available to each and every one of us. So tell us a little bit about that and how you got it started. Um, so, you know, I had a varied background in terms of travel and education and even my own personal experiences. And when I ended up, you know, I did an internship with teaching and just fell in love with it. And so kind of scratched all the past experiences and said, let's go into the teaching. Much to a lot of people's surprise, a lot of people were like, what, you're going to drop this career and or this kind of path and go down this way. But it just felt good and it felt right and I had a good time doing it. Um, so when I started teaching, I was working in more of the low income neighborhoods. I was teaching middle school STEM and I loved it. And my goal every day was just to get the kids excited about learning. It was not so much about, you know, do they memorize every little part of the subject? It was more, did they have fun learning? Do they have fun in school? Because I felt like that would set them up for the future in a better way than just memorizing, you know, stages of the cell cycle or whatever it might be. And um, when I moved to Chicago from Los Angeles, I was looking for a school where I can kind of do the same thing, where I was able to do really student-centered, hands-on learning. And I didn't find that, so that's when I started the company. So I kind of took all of my ideas from traveling and from teaching and put them together, and that's where the name came from, WorldWise. It's just an idea of, you know, everyone's connected, but we all have our place in the world and have a role in making the world a better place. Love that. And so Love what it. do you consider your mission to be? I definitely think that my mission is helping people find their true voice and their authentic selves and then helping to guide them on the path that is uniquely theirs. Because I do feel like, especially as children, we have a lot of people telling us what to do and how to do it and what we should be and what kind of person we are and labeling us. And we sometimes aren't able to really input who we are ourselves. And then we end up following a path that someone else laid for us and end up in careers that we don't like or doing something that, you know, was to make mom and dad happy, but really doesn't make us happy or whatever it might be. So I really work hard on helping um, students and even adults, you know, find, you know, their natural rhythm of who they are and be able to find a successful pathway in that. I love that. It really speaks very much to the message that we share here on the High Vibe Nation, 
which is about really tapping in to that passion mm -hmm. in the inside of yourself and getting clear about what makes your heart sing, what really causes you to really feel that that sense of happiness and that vibration of joy. And so what kind of students do you work with? And, and then how do you go about helping them to tap into that unique part of themselves? So I think my natural talent has been helping those students that aren't excelling in the traditional school system. Um, they tend to be labeled as behavior problems or students with learning difficulties. And it would be funny as a teacher, I would start the school year with, you know, 25 kids. But by the end, I'd have over 40 because I, everyone would give me the problem kids, you know, the ones that were giving them issues. And then they'd be fine in my room. Um, so it's really understanding Yes, this is what's happening according to their grades and their scores, but it's really a symptom of something else. There's something deeper going on with that student. And so really digging deep to understand them as human beings and figuring out what is it that they need to be able to succeed rather than trying to fit them into the system that we have laid out, kind of making the system work for them and then allowing them to flourish and have a voice and have a role in what's going on seems to be really authentic, um, really effective. So I tend to work more with students where just the traditional system isn't really working for them and getting them to a point where they can fit into that traditional system, where they can blend into society. So getting them to a place of confidence and independence and then letting them to be able to still be their unique selves, but fit into what the world has laid out for them rather than constantly being an outlier in a way. And the way that we do that, you know, I, I say like one of my superpowers is kind of working with those kids that don't fit in the system, but also finding instructors that are really passionate. Um, and so I have about 50 tutors now, and they're all just so dedicated to helping students not just get good grades, but really helping them to become successful in life, because that's really what it's about. You know, if you get and I know we all know people like that who have these amazing degrees and all these credentials, but then have no like personal skills or no, you know, like they're just maybe not good people. And so really working with them to intertwine into our instruction, actual content on metacognition, which is thinking about how you think or interpersonal skills and empathy and leadership skills, entrepreneurial mindset. So there's a lot of things that we kind of interweave in there to make sure that the kids actually do have that deliberately taught to them rather than just assuming they'll figure it out. Hmm. Love that. So how do you differ from other tutoring companies? I think that other tutoring companies are really focused on, again, treating those symptoms. So, you know, just it's almost I guess you can liken it to like, you know, if you go to a doctor because you have pain, they just give you pain meds. OK, yes, you're treating the pain. But what is the what's causing that pain? You know, don't you want to know the deeper issue of what's really going on? Because it's going to articulate in another way and cause bigger problems down the line. So I think that a lot of other tutoring companies are just giving the pain pill, you know, just kind of, you know, treating that symptom of the grades where we really take the effort to figure out what is really going on with this kid. And a lot of it is a work, you know, it's, it's sometimes easier just to be like, you know, here's the pain pill or here's the answer to the question, just do it and get him good grades. But what's that going to do to the child the next year, the year after as an adult, you know, in their relationships, in their career. And so we really put in that effort now to help them to learn the skills so that they don't need a tutor. And I think that's another thing that differentiates us I know we're doing a good job if they don't need us anymore because I don't want them to rely on us all the time. Our job as educators is to empower the kids to be able to seek out answers, to ask the right questions, to come up with solutions. That's that's our job as educators, not to just constantly throw a bunch of information they need to memorize. So we're also in our company working hard to just get them to be really active in their own lives and the, and the world around them by constantly questioning and innovating and solving and, you know, doing more than just the root um, actions you need to get good grades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that speaks so much to me too from, you know, because I have a visual uh, and kinesthetic learning style. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, I go back to, cause I came up during the seventies, I went to elementary school in the seventies. And back in those days, it was make you, um, well, they made they put you in front of the classroom 
And then if you didn't know what they were wanting you to know, then they would make fun of you or the teacher would, you know, display, oh, that's wrong. You know, and of course, everybody in the classroom would laugh. And then what would happen was, is that became a trigger in me for years later through the school system. And even, for example, with math, I remember a third grade teacher making fun of me in math. And from then on out, I automatically hated math for the rest of right. my life. Till still to this day, I hate yeah. math, you know, mm -hmm. and it sounds hear like that story crazy. all the time, oh, all the time. Yeah, it drives mm -hmm. me crazy. And so from hearing what you're sharing with us, oh, my God, where have you been? I mean, <laughs> honestly, all of the schools need to have a system like your system, because it, it makes me think of when I used to teach um church, you know, and we teach, you know, the principles, the laws of nature, and everything you just said is what we used to teach those kids. And now, you know, 15 years later, they're doing what you're talking about right yeah, now. Exactly. And, you know, speaking to the learning styles, that's one of the things we do right away is try to understand, because everyone naturally has a strength, a learning style strength. And so we really work with the kid rather than you know, making them feel bad for not being able to do a project a certain way because that's not their natural learning style. We really work to emphasize their learning style to get them a place of, uh, to a place of confidence where they're doing well. And then we teach them strategies for the other learning styles because that is life. You know, life isn't going to be all auditory and kinesthetic. You need to know the visual and more of the tactile as well. And so, that's the point is just to get them to a position where later in life they're using these skills in any situation and they they're excelling in no matter what situation you put them in and they feel good and they feel confident and that in itself has a ripple effect to people around them. They become leaders, you know, they shape other people in their lives. They, they take those lessons that we gave them or like you said, the lessons you gave and they propagate that out. So that's really we look at this as like a holistic and also a, a massive network, you know, it is one kid, but one kid can make all the difference in someone else's life and then someone else's life. And really, if we just put in that effort now, I mean, the, it just it boggles my mind to think what could the, what could society look like, you know, in the future, if we, we all really focused on this. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's such a great point because, you know, from the educator's standpoint, nine times out of 10, they have zero time during the day to deal with kids individually. And mm -hmm. so when you've got parents now that are trying to pick up slack, but they're working a job and they've got the kids, you know, however many days a week to try to teach them themselves, but they're only maybe half time or, you know, quarter mm -hmm. time. And then they've got to fill in all these blanks. How do, you, how do people find the balance? So, you know, one of the things that I try to remind people is it does sound heavy. It sounds daunting, the stuff that we talk about, but it really is, you know, small changes cause big changes. Sometimes it's just a minor shift in your language to a child, um, not laughing at them or making fun of them could have a big impact saying instead, good job. You know, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. so minor, but it really can empower them in massive ways. So there's, you know, a lot of main, little tiny shifts that you can do even as a parent in the way you speak to your child or the opportunities you present to them that really bring out that innate um, curiosity in them and that problem solving, but also, you know, brings out who, what are they truly interested in and what is their true pathway just by talking to them and listening to them and giving them, you know, opportunities to explore. And that doesn't necessarily mean put them in piano class, put them in Taekwondo, put them in this. Sometimes it's literally like kid, go figure it out. <laughs> you know, like my office door is closed. I'm in meetings. Here's a bunch of stuff, figure it out like get bored for a while, you know, because that's where creativity happens. And that's where, you know, they kind of work through the struggle and then they come out of it and look what I came out of or what, look what I created. That's resiliency. You know, that's um, skills of coping mechanisms. So there's a lot of things that sounds daunting, but if you just sometimes just let it be and do what feels good, it's actually the right thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things I've been doing is trying to break down a lot of what we do for parents, because I know it's very natural to us because this is my heart, this is my passion, but there's some things that we do naturally that other people are like, wow, I never thought of that. And so I'm trying to break it down into really easy things that parents can do at home 
that also takes the pressure off them where they're not thinking I have to do this and this and this. It's more like, no, just kind of chill out a little bit. <laughs> like it actually is, it's pretty easy to just let the kids be who they naturally are. Mm -hmm. Well, when you talk about resiliency, it makes me think that you're creating new habits, not only for the children, but you're creating new habits for the parents. Mm -hmm. And when the parents start to model that behavior, it becomes a cohesive relationship between the, the parents and the child. And then we all know, it. I mean, just like what you just said, that whole feeling good, feeling happy, feeling proud and passionate, you know, will go on into other areas of their life. So how are you able to track this? I mean, I'm sure you're tracking some of the analytics of all this and, 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 and how, you know, it's improving just a whole range of people. I mean, the easiest way to track is, you know, grades and scores mm -hmm. on tests. That's that's easy. We always have, you know, if the kid's doing a, a test like the ACT, we'll do a diagnostic in the beginning and then we track progress along the way. So that's a, the more quantitative, you know, that's more of the data side of it. But really, it comes down to my way of tracking is I'm checking in with the parents and checking in with the kid. I'm checking in with the tutor. And it's just constantly like everything's calm in my house. My child woke up this morning and did their work themselves. And I didn't even have to tell them, you know, like, or the, or the pitch, you know, tutor is like, everything was really good. He had all his work ready to go this time. It's really those more qualitative things that show that there's progress. And then really the way I know we're doing well is when they say, you know, we're good. Either we don't need the tutoring anymore, or you know what? They just love the tutor so much. We're going to keep paying for it just because it's peace of mind. I had one mom tell me you're cheaper than therapy. And I was like, okay. Um, and if that's fine, I mean, we'll do that too. But you know, that's a, the final test of knowing we did the right thing. And, and I know it's, you know, they come back with their other children or they refer other families. So I know it's, you know, they're happy with the service, but they just are at a point where they aren't needing us anymore. And that's, that's how I know we did a good job. Well, and so can you tell us a little bit about the structure? Because I know there's a lot of parents that are exploring options right now. So are you working with the kids in conjunction with the school's curriculum? Or are you providing additional curriculum? How does that work? So, you know, being a former teacher myself, I do always consider us an extension of support for the schools. I, I kind of look at it as, you know, if it was divorced parents. You know, if we were doing one thing and the school is doing another, that's not beneficial to the kid at all. So. I really want to know what the schools are doing, what services they're already providing, and make sure that the student is taking advantage of all those. And we're almost like their last resort. You know, the tutor is like, I tried this, I talked to this, I did that, you know, I did everything. I'm still a little confused about this particular part. Okay, now we can help, that kind of thing. So I do, I do really want to understand the school's curriculum. Um, but when it comes down to if you know individual students, it really depends on what everyone's going through. And right now, 2020 is a little wacky. So, you know, I have some parents that are looking for someone just to support with the e-learning. You know, the school is giving them um, their content and they just need someone to help their kid get on the internet at the right times and actually turn in the assignments the correct way. That's fine, we can do that. I have some that are saying they look, they're looking especially for the younger kids for more social socialization mixed with enrichment. And in that case, we're doing the learning pods, but then we're doing enrichment, like maybe music class or art class, you know, adding something else into there. Um, and then we also have like, you know, the ones that are learning something totally new that's outside of school, like the ACT prep, or maybe, you know, we have kids who wanna learn coding or robotics or, you know, statistics randomly or psychology. I had a lot of this this summer. And so we actually developed the curriculum around that as well. I have a really varied, base of students. So I'm sorry, tutors. So my tutors all have really broad backgrounds with, you know, specializing in different age groups and different subjects. So it's kind of like at this point, anyone who comes at me with anything, I got someone for them. <laughs> so we, we really do whatever the family is looking for. That's really cool. And, you know, it, and what keeps speaking to me while I'm listening to you share all of this is what's really, it sounds like what's really happening is you're bringing the child back into themselves mm -hmm. and you're bringing them home and, and helping them to realize that their answers and their solutions and the real them is on the inside. So I was just curious, how do you explain the difference between adult-led learning with a teacher versus student-centered learning? What's the difference between that? 
So the difference, and, and I'll, I'll um, break it down kind of in the context of what's happening in 2020, since a lot of parents are taking control of their child's learning and are looking for that. Mm -hmm. So the main difference is rather than thinking about what your child needs to learn, which is mainly, you know, reading, writing, and doing math, you know, being able to articulate themselves and solve problems is kind of what the main goals of learning are. Rather than finding content that makes the child learn those skills, you can instead base the content off of the child's interests and give them some choice in the matter. So like when I was a teacher, I would actually do these grids where I would have different learning styles in each column and different kind of learning goals in each row. And I would tell the kids they had to choose where there's something from every column and something from every row. So I'm still hitting everything, but I'm allowing them to make the choice in what particular task they're doing. At home, it could be something like, you know, my child is really into butterflies. All right, I could teach math, science, <laughs> history, writing, reading. I could do it all with butterflies, you know, and it's really taking that interest, but still shaping the curriculum around that. The end of the, the bottom line is really listening to your child's voice, letting them have input, whether it's just them telling you what they're interested in or actually choosing the activities. That's really what it is about being student centered. And by giving them that choice, they're still hitting those main learning goals, but they're also a lot more invested in it. So that also helps a lot with that motivation. A lot of parents are talking to me now, my kid is not motivated, which I could see they're bored. They're bored yeah. with what's happening with learning right now. Yeah. And, and so this helps them get motivated because now it's something they're interested in. They're much more engaged. They have much more pride um, in what they deliver because it's something they actually care about. And it is so much easier for the parent to just go butterfly reading comprehension and hand it over rather than dig, dig, dig. And what am I doing the right thing kind of aspect of it. So it, again, it goes back to that. Just, just take the easy way. Don't overanalyze it. You know, sometimes you just kind of have to listen to your kid, communicate with your child and just do what feels like the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's so wonderful. That reminds me a lot of what is called lifestyle of learning, which I know has been, you know, familiar to homeschoolers for many years, where you're really encouraging your kids to learn from the things that they love. And so then it becomes a lifestyle. And so how are you kind of building on that philosophy to help kids to then take that into other areas of their lives? You know, they kind of do it naturally. Once you get them excited about learning and they feel good when they're learning, and they start finding their own innate self-confidence, you'll find that they start taking more risks and they start asking more questions and they start advocating for themselves more saying, you know, you know what, mom, I don't want to read this passage. I'd like to read this one instead, you know, and really listening to them. They'll start doing it naturally when they feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And that's another way I also monitor success when I have students who will say to me, mm, I think you did this step wrong, or, you know, actually there's another way you could solve this. I applaud that, you know, like if you come at us respectfully and say, here's my reasons why I want to do it this way, that's another way to really facilitate them as individuals. So they, they will do that naturally. Now, if they don't, that often is a sign that you have to work a little bit more on building that innate self-confidence in them so that they do feel more comfortable doing that. And I always encourage parents and educators to work harder at, um, praising them for things that aren't necessarily tied to their academics. Mm. So instead of saying to them, you know, good job getting an A on that test, which is fine, but also say, wow, you studied really hard for this test and you didn't give up. And even though last time you got a C, you didn't let that stop you. You learned from it and you found new ways to study. So praising their effort and their work more than the outcome, you'll find that gives them, and even the little things along the way, rather than just the final end of it, it really motivates them to keep doing that on their own. Mm -hmm. I love that you reminded me of that because I just had a conversation. I have twins. They're 16. Uh -huh. And um, of course, you know, they're bored with this online learning and stuff. But I just had a conversation very similar with one of them this morning. And, you know, I was very careful to empower her, but also have the discussion around, you know, are you doing your homework and what is it that you're struggling with? And then I told her, I said, listen, it's not because I want to beat you up and it's not because I want to break you down. Well, it's because I care. It's because I want you to have a good life and I want you to make decisions that open you up 
you know, to a good life. So why isn't this in our everyday school programs? I mean, this is something that, my goodness, just like you said, imagine our world, imagine our educational system, like what you're sharing with us here on the High Vibe Nation. I mean, what can we do to maybe help that and support that? Really good question. So again, coming from a teacher standpoint, it's not any one person's fault. It's not like we can point a finger at one thing and say this needs to be fixed. The, the system is, is doing a disservice for sure. I think a lot of it comes down to it's just too big. I mean, I'm in Chicago. The Chicago public school system is so massive that it's hard when you get that big to really monitor and train people effectively. Um, but also, you know, there's just a lot of mandates that are put on teachers that they have to accomplish in order to show that the kids are learning. And it's really looking for those quantitative um, data because that's the easiest to analyze because you can actually break it down mathematically. But we have to think of other ways that we can be analyzing learning and also providing training to teachers of how uh, other ways to teach rather than just sitting in the front of the room and lecturing. Another part of it is I think that people really think it has to be separate curriculum because, in, you know, when the kids are younger, there really is separate curriculum for social emotional learning. You know, it's a separate lesson that the parent, the teachers really do with them. Right. But I, I don't think that it needs to be separate. We don't we can sit here and teach these kids calculus while also boosting their self-esteem and teaching right. them coping mechanisms, you know. And so I think a lot of people don't realize how much you can intertwine it into the instruction. One of the good things that I think is occurring from the pandemic is that a spotlight is shining on this. Parents have their kids at home and they're like, oh my gosh, my kid can't, is not self-directed. My kid has no task management skills, you know, all of these things. So parents are starting to realize I've been kind of handing my kids off to the schools, assuming that this was taking place because they're not coming to me and asking me, but really they're going to other adults and having them lead them. And so now that that's all been taken away, we really realize how much the kids are lacking. So I think, you know, a good place to start is parents talking to the schools and saying, I want this curriculum at my school. You know, I would like training for the teachers and the more voices and parents that are saying that to the school district and the schools, the more they're going to hear that because there are specialists out there and there are organizations that can, you know, go in for a one day workshop and teach teachers how to do this. And like I said, I'm trying to break it down as well. Um, it's just sometimes a matter of not knowing, you know, you just kind of have to learn how to do it. And then once you learn how to do it, it's super easy to incorporate. Well, and I think one of the other challenges that parents face is, you know, how to really support their kids and being motivated to do the work online by themselves, especially when they don't have access maybe to the teachers all the time and they're trying to get through, say, a math problem and, and there's no one to really assist them. So how can parents support their kids when they're struggling from that perspective? So, you know, when we, we have that as well, because, you know, we only work with the kids maybe once or twice a week. But what happens on the other days? They're not with us. So we really work on helping the kids to understand all the resources that are available to them, which is so different than when we were kids. I mean, it's literally at their fingertips. Sometimes they just don't know how to find it or how to, how to weed through what's not useful to find what is useful. So some of that is just modeling for them. You know, even as a tutor, there's times I don't know the answer to something and I model for them, this is how I'm gonna find the answer to that, which is good, it shows a human component to myself. You know, I'm still learning and I'm still growing and I'm not afraid to admit that, but it also models for them, this is how, you know, the steps you go through it. Um, so in the beginning of the year, for some of my students that are a little more um, self-sufficient, we like to try to compile a bunch of resources that I know are useful for them. And then that's kind of their go-to, the ones that they go to right away when they have a question. Personally, with my company, I've also started a standby tutoring program that you can just hop on for 15 minutes with the tutor. And you're like, I'm just stuck on this one problem. Can you help me get started? Because you're right, they're not having the accessibility of the teachers anymore or even their peers as readily. And I, I was worried about that. And I started that back in the spring where, or even parents, you know, I've had a lot of parents who reached out to me like with Common Core and they're like, I don't even know how to do this. How am I supposed to help my kid? Right. All right, cool. Hop on here. We'll explain it for 10, 15 minutes just to get you rolling. And then you can go back and do it on your own. So I have tutors that are available seven days a week from like eight in the morning to nine at night, even on Saturday and Sunday. And it's just a matter of kind of pop in and <laughs> see what you need help with. Um, but a lot of it is getting them to be self-sufficient and so that that's the last resort. 
So they've tried every other avenue. And even though the teachers aren't accessible, there's a lot of other things that are. So really looking through all of those first and then narrowing it down to where you're still having trouble. And that's not something that's done immediately with kids. It takes time for us to get our kids into that habit. But that's always our goal is to get them to the point where they can assess their own learning seek out the understanding on their own and then kind of come to us almost like a coach, you know, where they're, where they need help with something specific. And that's a good place to be because we do that as adults too. And there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, and I, and I can relate on a lot of levels to that because I'm a lot older than my children. I mean, I'm 40 years older than my twins. Mm -hmm. And um, so the gap between the way that they teach now versus the way that I learned when they were younger was very difficult. And it was also very frustrating for me, but it was frustrating for them. But with the internet and obviously being, I'm a lifelong learner. So I just adore yeah. learning. I adore knowledge, yeah. information, all of that. And encouraging the girls to do that, to seek information. I told them, you, you know, you've got this huge resource of all these things that you can go out on the internet and you can find the information that you're seeking. Mm -hmm. So I like that you're sharing that because I'm also encouraging them, you know, to go out and find it before they come. Cause they're just frustrated if I don't know how to do it their way. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. And that's good for them to do that. And, and you're, it's, I like that you brought up the lifelong learner. That's actually my line in my company because it, it really goes back again to my background. If we can just get them having fun learning, finding the answer is going to be fun for them. You know, it's a challenge, you know, seeking out new things, or if you encounter something you don't know, that's, that's exciting for them to find out how to find, you know, get the right answer for that or figure it out. So those are all components of being a lifelong learner. And I think that's, that's where it starts is just getting them excited about learning, associating learning with the positive experience, knowing that they have fun with it. And then that will grow into other things that just naturally happen without even having to be taught. Mm, that's beautiful. So what are some of your favorite stories of kids that you've just seen really grow through the tutoring process? Oh, gosh, that's a good one. I have <laughs> so many because <laughs> it's been 15 years um, and they stay in touch with me, which is awesome. So I've had kids that I've started with in middle school and then they go through high school, go through college and then kind of start telling me what they're doing now. So it's another, you know, verification that what we're doing is working because they come back and are saying, you know, I still do this and I still use this. And a lot of them ended up being tutors or teachers in their high school or college um, experiences, which is really a sign of being a lifelong learner if you want to actually teach and share with other people. So that's exciting. But I would say one of I had one student where I got her in 11th grade and it was five minutes into the session and I said, oh, this girl's dyslexic. Like it was right in front of my face, but some people don't know what to look for, for that. Like, mm -hmm. again, this is, I have like two superpowers is finding good tutors and figuring out what's up with the kid. And I saw it right away. And she was in Mandarin. I mean, she was, I was like this poor girl. And so that was a tough situation of how do you bring this up to the parent because there's guilt and, you know, that's also kind of has a stigma around it. And what do I do in that regard? But got through that recommended services for her, got tested. The doctor said she's so dyslexic that she has to be a genius to have gotten this far in the grade she did, which is great because she coped with it and found coping mechanisms or, you know, ways to deal with it. But by now having a diagnosis, we were able to then help her with that last little push, some specific strategies to help with the things that were just really giving her a hard time and make those easier for her. And she just took off. I mean, totally excelled, went on her own, completely self-directed, um, stayed in touch through college and then just recently reached out to me, has started her own business and was kind of telling me about that, where she's helping other people with her business. And, you know, just back to thank you so much for your help back then kind of thing. So not to say that she wouldn't have been successful anyway, because she had that drive and that dedication that's natural and, and can be attributed also to her parenting or maybe some teachers along the way, whatever it would be. But it definitely made it so that she could take the all that energy she was putting over here and then put it into other things to make her go further. So that's just one of the stories where, you know, I'm just, I'm proud of her for not letting that hold her back, not letting that label her or stop her. Instead, she overcame that hurdle and just took off. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Well, and you're, and she's paying it forward. I mean, mm -hmm. the beauty of it is, is I always like to talk about reciprocal flow. And so by you encouraging her, you know, that's coming back to you and 
it's coming back to her because she's now pay, paying it forward. And what a beautiful thing. And that's actually what I say. I say, you know, to get our children to be competent and conscious leaders, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's not, it's not just about the grades and the degree, you know, you just really have, you have to have the right mindset and be able to be a leader for others to then encourage them to follow a path as well. So we really work with them to feel that, you know, empowerment and that leadership and the empathy and, you know, all these interpersonal skills so that they can go out and then affect change, not just in their life, but even around them. So she's smart already naturally, but we, we just had to make sure she also had the mindset to go with it. Nice, nice. I love it. So with, you know, all these changes that are taking place, how can parents kind of take advantage of this? and you know start to work with their own school systems to make some of these changes that need to be made so one of the things i've been doing because i do re recognize it's kind of daunting for a lot of people is i have been diluting it and breaking it down even into like daily things that parents can do i started a facebook group where every day i have a tip i think this week we're working on focus how to help your kids improve their focus so a tip you know you can do this with your child to help them with their focus kind of thing that could be definitely beneficial to parents who are trying to take it into their own hands. So looking for something that's more practical steps that they can do themselves. And then as far as, you know, affecting change in the school, you know, I don't know, and this coming from a teacher point of view, if parents recognize how powerful their voices are in that school, because no principal wants to make a parent mad or have bad press around their school, you know? So like, not to say that you should go in there guns blazing kind of thing, but you know, they hear you, they hear your voices, squeaky wheel gets the grease, you know? So your, your voices are powerful as parents. Um, I would even sometimes say more powerful than the teachers. And that's just from, you know, having experiences where I've been told to do things because a parent, you know, wanted it kind of thing. So I would encourage you to use your voice and to really advocate for your children if this is something that you think is valuable and maybe even, you know, make it easier for them by saying here, this is something that can be used because cut out the work they have to do, you know, try doing this program, try using this. There's so many resources out there in addition to my company that are doing these because the need is there. And I think that the schools are starting to recognize it, but definitely parents are starting to recognize it. So this is the time, you know, school's already been flipped on its head. Everything is changing when it comes to education. Let's, why, why go back to the traditional, you know, like let's, let's reimagine it. Let's do something different. Let's make it better because our world is rapidly changing. And as great as America is, we are kind of falling behind in terms of education and we need to do something. And this is the perfect time to do it. Heck yeah. And you know, <laughs> it, it, I go back to your um, reading about you and I was reading a lot of information about worldwide tutoring. And one of the things that really stuck out to me is the word encouragement and how you have encouragement really just shared so much in that. And the thing that stood out to me too is how you encourage people to reimagine the educational system. What do you mean by that? So definitely getting more student-centered, like we discussed earlier, really listening to our kids. I think we think we know what's best for them mm -hmm. and we try to kind of bubble them and shelter them and put them in this little like spot because we think that's the right thing. Um, but they're really, really smart. They're really intuitive. They're really savvy. And sometimes just kind of listen to them, communicate with them. Like you were saying, you communicated with your tw twins and you're talking to them. That's great. You know, talk to your kids and really shape the education to them. I do think we have to do something with the size class sizes, school sizes, something has to happen. There's a reason why a lot of charter schools are doing well. You know, a lot of them are smaller. Um, we just got too big. And I think that's the case for a lot of things in our life. Things just kind of got too big and you just kind of lose touch. And when it comes to educating our youth, like the future, that's the last thing we want to lose touch with. We don't want to just funnel them through like a factory, you know? So that's definitely something we need to, we need to pay more attention to and, and put more effort into as well. Um, and then I would encourage schools to consider more project-based learning, especially because I think that's more reflective of life. And so getting them more real life skills that are 
while I do, you know, I have this conversation with my students all the time. When am I ever going to use this in life? You know, that's yep. always the thing they want. I'm like, I use it, but uh, <laughs> not a lot of other people do. Um, I get what the schools are doing. They're really trying to teach kids problem solving skills by giving them a math problem, for example. I understand that, but there's we're, we're smarter than that. We can come up with better ways to teach kids certain skills rather than just having them memorize formulas or, you know, write a paper on something that really isn't valuable or, you know, I mean, one of the things I know my motto is if you can Google it, why memorize it? Like, it's just silly, you know? Mm -hmm. So really reshaping it to be more effective in giving them real life skills rather than what we've been doing in the past, which maybe was good in the past because we didn't have the internet and all of this, but we, we got it. We got to shape it to what's going on in the world today. I think that's so important because, you know, we can look back over the last 10, 15 years as homeschooling has become more and more popular and we're seeing kids come out of homeschooling and be so successful and start businesses and, and do all these things. And so we've been in the mindset in the past that, well, you have to send your kids to school or they're not going to get an education. And so what I hear you saying is that's obviously not necessarily the case. It's just how do we approach educating them if they're not in that same old system. Exactly. And I know you brought this up earlier, you know, the lifestyle learning kind of idea. That's another motto I have is learning is life and life is learning. And I got that from homeschooling, you know, because that's really the way they look at it. I mean, they really only dedicate two to three or four hours a day to actual sitting down and doing work. And then the rest of the day is natural learning, you know, learning about the world around you and and investigating and being able to monitor yourself and your own questioning and your own problem solving. And, and that's, that's valuable in, in life, you know, give that person a project at your job and let them just go rather than having to kind of set them up with what to do. Those are the ones who are going to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people were, are mostly worried with homeschooling about the socialization, but you know, that's so homeschool, they have their own network and they have everything going with socialization, but the fact that homeschool is a smaller network and it's being effective and it's student-centered project-based learning, there's a sign right there. We probably need to shift our traditional system to be something similar. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that there are a lot of teachers who want to move in this direction and have the ideas because just from a couple of situations I've seen, like the other day I saw my daughter on the, at the kitchen table and I was watching her, over her shoulder to see how the teacher was teaching and stuff. And this guy was really cool. Yeah. And the project that he was talking about is he's talking about a clay project and, you know, what could they design something, you know, for their job or, you know, something yeah. like that, encouraging them. But the cool thing was, is I was hearing the way he was talking to each student yeah. and, and he really had gotten to know their personality and he mm -hmm. was using language that was geared towards their personality. And that's, I think they're realizing, you know, how can people like that, how can they find out more information about what you're doing and maybe involve that? Cause you, I'm sure you want to be able to spread this worldwide. Mm -hmm. That's actually one of the things I'm working on this month is I personally am stepping back a little bit from working with students and focusing more on teaching the teachers mm -hmm. because I do, you know, I, I love teaching, so I'm still having fun with it, but I do agree with you. There's a lot of people who have the passion for it. I mean, I see it with my tutors. They come in, they know this is the right thing to do. They love teaching, but they just need those practical strategies. Okay, it sounds great, but how do I do it? You know, what does this actually look like when I'm working with a student? And a simple thing, like know them individually, you know, and if that requires having a spreadsheet on the side and you're like, Jacob, soccer, you know, Sally, music, whatever it is, um, but just kind of getting to know them as people really is inspiring to them. And if we even look back to our own experiences, nobody really remembers, you know, wow, that was an amazing lecture on, <laughs> you know, physics and, and kinetic energy, we really remember those teachers who made it special and really connected to us. And those are the moments that shape you as a person. Yeah. So taking the time to do that is good. And it actually seems like it's a lot of effort in the beginning, but it'll make it less work for you in the end because you don't have to chase kids to turn in their work. You don't have to get them to be more motivated or you know interactive in the classes. They're gonna do it naturally because they enjoy being there and they feel seen and heard. Mm -hmm. So even though it's a little more, and this is kind of the motto of being a teacher, you put in a lot of work in the beginning to make sure 
all the systems are in place, but then you sit back and it just runs itself, you know? So it is some more work in the beginning, but it's totally worth it. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of feedback are you getting from the kids about how this is helpful for them? A lot of it, I don't know, you know, we work on a lot of how to put emotions into words with them. We really work on their emotional self-regulation and self-awareness of that. But a lot of it is just, you can see it in their attitude, you know, even from one session to the next, or even their completion of work or their eagerness to do things, you know, Um, some of it can be language like, I'm just bad at math. And then after a few sessions, they're kind of like, oh, I I'm actually really like these ones. These are kind of fun. I mean, those are small things, but that's a huge shift in mentality mm-hmm. to go from I'm bad at something to actually I kind of like this. This is fun. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if they're necessarily saying, wow, this is empowering me to be a great leader, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I see in them that that little shift is kind of like a growth mindset and they realize, oh, I am capable of things. You know, I can shift what. I was to actually be something different. It is in me to do whatever I set my mind out to do. So they they don't maybe recognize it, but they feel good, you know, <laughs> and that's and that's that's enough for me. I don't need them to say, you're doing a great job making me be a leader. You know, I just want yeah. them to show up and be happy being there. And and that's good. That's such a good point because that was another thing that I heard one of the math teachers saying to one of um, my girls is so that there was this, you know, your typical child that comes in and he's all like, why? Yeah. Why do I need to do this? Yeah. Why do I need to learn? I hate this. And I heard this guy literally say, why? Because I care. Why? Because I want to empower you. Why? Because I want you to go out and be a successful leader Mm -hmm. and I want you to love your life. That's why he said that I heard him and oh my God, he gave me the chills everywhere. That's awesome. Yeah. And they, and they can sense it, you know, like, again, I taught at low income schools and, you know, if you're teaching middle school, I was in South central California. Those kids did not want to be there. They're like, who is this lady coming in here telling us what to do? But I did everything from love and I was hard on them. You know, I mean, I, I had, you know, strict requirements and consequences. And I carried out those consequences. And you guys, you know, as a mom, I mean, that's really what a lot of it is, is setting expectations and then following through and doing it with love, you know, not anger, not disappointment, but truly like, I know you can do better than this. And I'm going to put in so much work. It's easier for me to ignore you and to just send you to someone else, but I'm going to keep working on you and get, stay on you because I love you. And it's funny. I mean, they, they, they can tell. And within a few weeks, they'll, they put me through the ringer the first few weeks. But after that, I mean, anything I ask these kids to do, sure. <laughs> like no questions, they would just do it, you know? And it really, they can tell their kids are very intuitive. They know if you're doing it for the right reasons. Sure. And I well, do say that to parents too, you know, when they question a lot of, am I doing the right thing? I always say, if you do it from a place of love, it's the right thing. Like don't, don't overanalyze. If everything you're doing is coming from you love your child, then you're fine. (laughs) You know, they'll see that. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love that you bring that up because I think it's helpful for parents to look at education and realize this can actually be a transformative process. It's just not a transfer of data. It's more than that. You're right. That's a perfect way of saying it. Yeah. And that's what education should be. I mean, It is true that kid is saying, why am I learning this? How am I going to use it in life? Because he's just being transferred. He's he's seeing it as a transfer of data, you know, but like it, it, that's, that's what educating should be is getting them to be wise, you know, like the world wise and getting them to be competent and conscious, but more than just the transfer data. Yeah, you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love how you keep bringing up data and how you're also to keep identifying you know, the, the model behavior that these teachers are, um, are sharing and passing on to the students. Yeah. Because one of the things that you talked about is that, you know, the kids are intuitive, they know, mm-hmm. you know, and so when these, when these kids um, hear from the teacher, prejudgment, for example, oh, mm-hmm. okay, well, you know, this person's this color, or they come from this type of family, and the teacher's treating us in a way you know, with anger or resentment, that's the cause of the behavior that the students, you know, inflict upon the teacher, but also shutting down, you know, in in their own learning. And a lot of teachers or even adults are probably not 
always aware that they're doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I know for me, being a teacher has been one of the most self-reflective things for me because I have to make sure I'm practicing what I preach, you know, that I'm monitoring my own emotions, that I'm going into them. Anything that's bothering me in the world is at the door. I'm not bringing that into the classroom, not bringing that into the session. Yeah, that full, you know, this is my job and this is what I'm going to do. But um, there, sorry, I lost my train of thought a little bit. But yeah, there's definitely, we need to look at it more from the human component. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's so important because the kids know if you're present or not. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, they know if you care. They know if if your if your heart is in it. We all have those experiences. I know with my nieces and nephews where I'm like on my phone, and that's when they start acting up, you know, or start getting extra clingy or you know noisy. They know you're not paying attention. You could be like, oh yeah, uh huh, yeah, but you're looking at your phone. They know. They're smart. So are you guys creating new curriculums? Are you looking at this whole whole COVID-19 in a different way and creating new modalities or, you know, what are your, what are you doing in reference to the COVID-19 with worldwide, worldwide? (laughs) So one of the first things I did was kind of like what you were saying, just recognizing that they were bored. And Mm -hmm. so we started an enrichment program, which we did create curriculum. Mm -hmm. And basically what I did is I just went to my instructors and said, Hey, what do you want to teach? What's something you're excited about? And they came up with really cool stuff. Like we have a chess class, we have origami, we have coding, we have acting, we have equitable leadership, which kind of goes to what you were saying earlier. Um, Just all these classes that they're excited about teaching basic personal finance. I know one of the comments we saw earlier, they need to learn more about financing. So that are going to teach them these practical skills, because again, we're still intertwining into them, those learning and life skills but allow them to explore personal interests in a fun way, allow them to find their unique voice. Like maybe this is something they're interested in and they're not really sure, Um, meet other people who have similar interests. And really the bottom line is just to get them having fun learning again, these poor kids. (laughs) And I had a lot of parents this summer who were like, that just made all the difference. You know, they were dragging their feet by the end of spring and then they just got another little flame and they're going into the school year with so much more, you know, renewed enthusiasm. So yes, we develop our own curriculum for that. But again, it's very shaped to the students. So depending on who signs up, we really understand where they're coming to us from, what knowledge they already have, what are they wanting to learn? And we shape the course around them. Um, you know, my motto is the personalized approach. So we really, we really make it for them. But then in terms of the school, you know, we can still take what's happening in the school and, and shape it to the student as well based on their learning style even, you know, shaping the strategies they use for studying an organization to help them manage what's going on in school that is with their strengths. So that is kind of our own content as well, where we're still taking the curriculum, but then shaping it in a way that they can then make it work for them. And then they can apply that to other classes on their own. Um, And that, again, just gets them to be a better student. You know, and rather than saying, I don't like the way the teacher, this this way this teacher teaches, or I don't like the subject. Okay, well, let's make it work for you because in in life, there's going to be things you don't like. You might have a boss you don't like. They might have a job task you don't like. Sometimes we just got to make it work, you know, and making a way to still make it enjoyable and get some meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. I love it. So what kind of programs do you have that parents can enroll in? So we have the enrichment classes. I extended those through the fall. Um, Again, just because I think the kids need something to get excited about. And I have the standby tutoring, which I think I'm going to keep for the whole school year, whether they go back in the spring or not. I think it's just nice for them to know, even if they never use it, just to know they have it there um, is is a nice feeling. Like I'm going to try everything. And then along the way, they find the answer. Okay, cool. But at least knowing there's someone there. So the standby tutoring and the enrichment are on the website, the Worldwide Tutoring website. I also have really been concerned about the um, equity of education based off of this remote learning and what is this doing to the achievement gap. That's obviously something near and dear to my heart because of my background in working with low-income students. So I started a student sponsorship program as well. 
So for individuals or corporations that would like to sponsor students for online tutoring, and these are kids that have been nominated by schools. So if there's schools that would like to nominate students that are, there's sometimes just kids and I've seen it too, that have so much promise, they just need that extra little help. And so we're just giving them that extra assistance where they can reach what they naturally would if they had that already, you know, or had that extra guidance or support. Um, and then we do test prep, we do college apps, college essays, um, jobs, um, internships and academics, we, we do it all. And it's all the way from my youngest student is two years old and then I have them up until their 50s. So all ages, all abilities, all subjects. I love it. I think what really has spoken to me through this whole thing is really getting this out there to teachers and and you know creating a curriculum, a program for you or your organization to really be able to share this way of teaching. Because I think that if you can connect the teacher with that feeling inside of them, that yeah. vision inside of them, they're going to take that on to the children. And just like you said, I mean, through this whole interview, when you feel better, when you feel good about what you're doing, it spreads out worldwide. Mm -hmm. And and I really love what you're doing. I've been sharing um, some of the ways for our audience members to get a hold of you as you've been speaking. But I want you because we also have our podcast. Mm -hmm. I want you to go ahead and um, just speak out some of them as I put them up on the screen so people who hear our podcast can reach you. Okay, so the website that's on now, which is worldwisetutoring.com, that's a great place to start. You'll find all of our services plus those blogs I was um, saying where I'm kind of diluting it down for parents and educators. That's a, a, a nice place to begin. I also have on there a student handbook. Mm -hmm. So that could be a resource for kids that are looking for answers, they can go there and see if something is there. So there's the student handbook there and it's the student handbooks on the website and it just says student handbook in the top right corner. Mm -hmm. And all of it's free, the resources, the blogs and the student resources are free um, just as a reference point. And then we are on all social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Yelp. <laughs> um, I even have a YouTube channel where I've done some things where I've seen a lot of kids struggle with. So. I put some videos up there, like 10, 15 minute videos, just to help them with, you know, div uh, dividing polynomials or whatever it might be. And then the Facebook group is um, where I'm taking them and putting them into daily tips. So that's really meant for parents and educators. So you can go in there. I've also compiled about 450 resources broken down by age and subject that are online and free. So it's kind of like, is your child struggling with reading? Try this app. Does your child want to do cool science experiments? Try this app. So like every day I'm giving you a resource and I'm also giving you a tip, but I'm really diluting it down so that it hopefully isn't so overwhelming. So you can just kind of scroll through there or even go to the little tabs and find something that fits for you. That's wonderful. And so for our audience members who are listening in on our podcast, um, you can go to the page. It'll actually show you the links to all of these uh, social media um, URLs that Lindsay has shared with us. So just make sure that you follow in the show notes and you'll see all that. Pam, why don't you go ahead and share with our audience members how they can reach us on social media? Of course, you can find us on the web at thehighvibenation.com. Also on Facebook at The High Vibe Nation and, of course, on Instagram at The High Vibe Nation. Wonderful. Well, it's been an amazing interview. I have absolutely loved everything that you've shared with our audience. Such such amazing positivity. And that's really what plants the seed for, you know, that to be watered worldwide is, is, is when we, um, you know, share this all together and then we open ourselves up to, like I like to always say, a greater, grander way of expressing and being in our world. Yeah. So thank you, Lindsay, so much for, for being a guest on the show today. Thank you for That's giving me the opportunity to share that with everybody, because I know it's a little frustrating right now, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we also want to thank all of our audience members as usual. Thank you all, Larry, Joe, and everybody that always comes on with all of us, Samuel Sneed, thank you so much for all your amazing comments today. And of course, Mikey Cohen and, 
and Larry Schneider. And of course, one of my very good friends, I used to own a health club, Phaedra O'Connor. She really, really loved what you had to share. So awesome. thank you, everyone. Ken Walls, of course, Ken came on with us today. We're <laughs> applauding you and sharing the amazingness of who you are. So once again, thank you, everyone, for being here. And until Wednesday evening, have an amazing rest of the night. Bye-bye now. Bye, everyone. From everybody here at the High Vibe Nation, we want to say thank you for choosing to raise your vibration. And of course, please like, share, and subscribe. If you need to find us on the web, check us out at www.thehighvibenation.com. Looking forward to seeing you on the next episode, and keep high vibing.